Good morning, everybody. Happy Monday. We have an amazing show for everybody today. What do we have, Crystal? Indeed we do. We got a lot of news to cover this morning. Zed Jelani is going to be on. He's going to break down this crazy controversy at the intersection of class and race at Smith College, profiled in the New York Times last week. We have Dr. Trita Parsi on to talk about those airstrikes in Syria from all angles. Um, but we wanted to start with CPAC over the weekend and the yes. big speech from Donald Trump. That's right. Because we hate ourselves, we're going to talk about <laughs> CPAC. And uh, Trump <laughs> made his triumphant return to CPAC, made a lot of news. We put together a montage of some of the most important parts. Let's take a listen. Well, thank you very much. And CPAC, do you miss me yet? Do you miss me yet? <laughs> to each and every one of you here at CPAC, I am more grateful to you than you will ever know. We are gathered this afternoon to talk about the future of our movement, the future of our party, and the future of our beloved country. For the next four years, the brave Republicans in this room will be at the heart of the effort to oppose the radical Democrats, the fake news media, and their toxic cancel culture. Something new to our ears, cancel culture. And I want you to know that I'm going to continue to fight right by your side. We will do what we've done right from the beginning, which is to win. We're not starting new parties. You know, they kept saying, he's going to start a brand new party. We have the Republican Party. It's going to unite and be stronger than ever before. I am not starting a new party. Actually, as you know, they just lost the White House, but uh, it's one of those things. But who knows? Who knows? I may even decide to beat them for a third time, okay? Beat them for a third time. So there you go, Crystal. I think that the most significant news there was, first of all, ruling out the third party, mm -hmm. saying, no, nope, I'm not going to do a third party. I have the Republican Party. True. That is, you know, empirically true whenever it comes to the polling and everybody who's behind him. Second thing, saying he might run again with the teasing. A lot of people are very divided on this, which is that it seems very much that he loves the will they, won't they game. Mm -hmm. The more I read about it, I'm just not sure because he essentially is the position of party leader without having to do anything. So all the stuff I've been reading is Ronna McDaniel's going down there. Steve Scalise is going down there. He's got all the party, you know, basically in his living room. And he can, run, the ring. he can run the party right from there. He doesn't actually have to be president. He's got his hit list. I didn't force you all to watch him read the entire hit list there um, on the stage of all the people. And McConnell all the people who voted and, for him. Actually, yeah. he left McConnell off the hook. So that was another very significant one. But what's interesting is he's building this large party apparatus. This was supposed to be his, like, flagship ship return and I think that the biggest news there is the third party one very much seeing it as his role is to purge the party of anybody who opposed him largely on stop the steal so yeah there you go look when and when you say run the party like mm -hmm. that's very loose phrasing yes. it's not like he does anything no no no, no. right yeah, it's all just this <laughs> it's like giving a speech or sending out some messaging um it's and this that's why I was always skeptical of the idea that he would start a third party or even ultimately start some sort of a media venture right. because that's a lot of work. You know, it requires, I mean, seriously, it requires yeah. like organizational competence. You have to have people who can do things. And one thing that his administration was not famous for was competence. They could not even get a question changed on mm -hmm. the census because they were so wildly, embarrassingly incompetent. So I was always a little bit skeptical of that. And look, as he rightly points out, why would you start a third party when you already completely control the Republican Party for mm -hmm. all intents and purposes? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So this is what the next four years are going to look like. It's going to be him throwing pot shots from the sidelines, playing will he or won't he, right. the whole reality show like Vendetta, who's on the hit list, who's up and who's down, who escaped his wrath, who's fired this time, all of that. That's what he's going to do for the next four years. Ultimately, does he run for president again? 
I have no idea. Right. Maybe he will as a lark. Maybe he'll, maybe he'll at the very last minute in some dramatic way hand the ball off to somebody else. But there's no way we're going to get clarity on that until the very last mo- moment. I think you're absolutely right on that front. And he's, I think he just enjoys this a, a little bit too much. He re- One of the things, I remember this even whenever he was president, the thing that he loved more than anything was being able to send out a tweet and send, send somebody over the finish line in a primary. Mm-hmm. So he's going to relish his role. The question is, is does he still have the same cachet? I think absolutely he does nationally. The, a real question is, is that if he is unsuccessful in unseating some of the people who did vote to impeach him or who did come out against him on Stop the Steal, that could actually you know, expose a chink in the armor, quote unquote, in terms of how it works for him and in terms of his power within the party. And there are some interesting indications beneath the surface. Let's throw the CPAC straw poll, which always take that with a very nah. large grain of salt. <laughs> but I still thought it was fascinating that only 55% percent of respondents said that they wanted Trump to be the 2024 nominee. 21 percent Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Obviously, they were down in Florida, so also remember that whenever it comes to that. That's and also, point. Christy Nome at 4 percent. And it's not like attendance was as wide as it has been. And so, et cetera, all caveats aside, remember uh-huh. Rand Paul won this thing like three years in a row, mm-hmm. and nobody cares what mm-hmm. Rand Paul has to say. Yeah, and all, Mitt Romney won it a bunch of times, that's too. Right. My How well, Times Have Changed. He was the actual nominee. But yeah, I'm saying <laughs> So from that perspective, however, I still found it notable. I said, wow, only 55%. I mean, you would expect that to be 75, 85. Mm -hmm. And that actually largely tracks with Republican polling, which is that 55% on the national level that I've seen say Trump should be the 2024 nominee. Ultimately, something like 90% say they would vote for him if he was the nominee, but don't necessarily want him to be the nominee. And 55% is great, obviously, relative to the entire rest of the field and the population, but it's not as much of a grip as one might think. It's the same divided problem in that Trump has the 55%, and the other 45 are scattered among DeSantis. I mean, 8% for, like, Trump Jr., Romney, etc. So I'm not, I don't want to downplay how much of a control he necessarily does have. But if you look at it, this is, again, ideologically all over the spectrum. In terms of what would it look like without Trump, then it's Ron DeSantis, Christy Nome, Trump Jr., Mike Pompeo, that one was Ted to Cruz. Yeah. Um, well, it, it, it makes some sense to me, I think, because, I mean, Ted Cruz obviously came in second. People forget he does have a lot of love amongst some of the grassroots people, mostly because he's the second most hated man in the party by liberals. Uh, <laughs> the rest of them, Trump Jr., obviously the natural heir. And then, uh, yeah, and so Christy Nome and Ron DeSantis. DeSantis, I think, had a large edge in that poll because it because was literally down in Florida. But yeah. he's also become a right-wing icon because of the lockdown stuff. Well, here's the other thing is that you would think actually that this CPAC crowd would be more of the true Trump believers because, I mean, CPAC is now all oriented around him. There was some like gold-plated Trump statue there. And I mean, all of the biggest have a photo. All of the biggest applause lines were about stop the steal Mm -hmm. or cancel culture and um, and then, you know, about Donald Trump himself. And he's obviously the big draw and the big headline and like the crescendo of the whole event. So if anything, I would kind of think that CPAC would represent more of the hardcore Trump base than the Republican Party at large. So, yeah, I was actually surprised to see not that what is a 55 percent is that low, but I thought it would be much more up at the like 75, 80 percent. Yeah. And so um, DeSantis, like you said, big edge because it was in Florida, but that's still interesting. And I think he has played the sort of culture war over both tech. We covered that here. And anti-lockdown very well. That was the other big applause line at CPAC. There wasn't a lot of policy. Actually, in some ways, Trump's speech had more policy in it. It than, was the most policy, uh, had the most policy in it by far. Talked a lot about immigration. Right. And, you know, I mean, look, a lot of it was ridiculous. But it had much more policy in it than most people. There wasn't a lot of discussion of anything other than these sort of culture war totems. Mm-hmm. The anti-lockdown stuff was big. All of that. Also, we're going to cover later on the show, not that much anti-Biden content. And it, what did, um, what was delivered was not that, you know, it was not right. big applause lines. So that's an interesting dynamic as well. But yeah, the other person that I do think it's worth keeping an eye on over the next four years, and you and I were kind of debating mm-hmm. this, is Christy Noam, up in, who's the governor of South Dakota, who... Um, 
She has that kind of Sarah Palin vibe. She does. She knows how to play all the culture war stuff. I mean, her record in terms of COVID deaths in South Dakota is atrocious because she just went completely against any of what public health experts were saying. But, you know, for these people, they don't, they don't care, right? The fact that she stood up to the yes. lockdown culture and all of that um, has made her a bit of a star. Her speech got a lot of attention online and I think there as well. So she's one to keep an eye on because I do think that she knows how to play that culture war game very effectively. She certainly does. And when culture war is everything that matters. Also, Trump likes her a lot. But you should not dis- you know, discount that in terms mm. of who we might be willing to endorse or say some nice things about. He said a lot of nice things about her during for the last year of his presidency. So there it is. It all basically comes down to Trump. Will he? Won't we? Will he appoint his son? Will he give Christy Nome, whoever else uh, decides that they want it? But it basically comes down to what he wants. And his eye is only on one ball, which is kicking people out who didn't agree with him on the very last thing he did as president. Of course, not a great political position for the Republican Party to be in. So there we go. We're going to tell you what's on our radar. So that's next. 